The choice for governor couldn't be more clear. John Bell Edwards, who answered our country's call and served as a ranger in the 82nd Airborne Division. Or David Vitter, who answered a prostitute's call minutes after he skipped a vote honoring 28 soldiers who gave their lives in defense of our freedom. David Vitter chose prostitutes over patriots. Now, the choice is yours. That is a TV ad currently playing in living rooms across Louisiana. With less than two weeks to go to the state's gubernatorial runoff, Democratic State Representative John Bell Edwards is going after his opponent, Republican U.S. Senator David Vitter, for his role in a prostitution scandal. In 2007, Vitter apologized for what he called a very serious sin after he was linked through phone records to the D.C. madam. Today, Vitter offered a rebuttal to his opponent's attack ad with a political ad of his own, of course. Fifteen years ago, I failed my family but found forgiveness and love. I learned that our falls aren't what define us, but rather how we get up, accept responsibility, and earn redemption. Next. Tonight for a debate between the runoff candidates for governor of Louisiana. LPB has a 40-year tradition of contributing to the democratic process, and tonight we continue that through this debate and other public forums. This tradition is a very valuable one for all of us, and we welcome you for this, this entire audience this evening. Thank you. And I'm Barry Irwin, president of the Council for a Better Louisiana. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Our debate tonight features the candidates in the runoff for Louisiana governor. First, State Representative John Bell Edwards and U.S. Senator David Vitter. And thank you both for joining us tonight. Thank you. Joining us with questions tonight are two journalists, Kelly Connolly Spires, a reporter and producer at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, and Jeremy Alford, editor and publisher of LawPolitics.com. Tonight we'll attempt to cover a lot of territory as we delve into topics and issues of great importance to the voters and citizens of Louisiana. A drawing was held earlier to determine the order of questioning and the order of closing statements. And the format this evening is designed to encourage a dialogue, a real dialogue, between the two candidates. We'll touch on seven subject areas. The governing style of the candidates, elementary and secondary education, the budget and taxes, workforce development, health care, infrastructure, and issues related to each candidate's campaign. Our panelists will provide background on a topic and pose a question to start the conversation. Then candidates will have a turn to ask each other questions. The panelists will ask follow-up questions to ensure clarity and responsiveness in the answers. We begin by exploring the governing styles of the two candidates, and to get us started is Kelly Spires, and she will pose that question to Mr. Vitter. Yes, let's talk about your management style. One of the two of you will be the next CEO of our state with tens of thousands of employees and a multi-billion dollar budget. What experience have you had in executive management, Mr. Vitter? Well, I've managed my Senate office for several years now, and I think if you talk to folks who interact with that on any number of issues, particularly Louisianians who we fight for and work with, they'll tell you it is a very, very responsive center office. Uh, I'm hands-on, that's my style. Very different, quite frankly, than Bobby Jindal, who's often been criticized for being aloof, not dealing with legislators, not talking with others directly. I'm very hands-on. Hundreds, even thousands of people have my personal cell phone number. I'm completely accessible. And I get in the weeds of important issues. Certainly, I have great staff to help me. I help direct them. Uh, but I, I get in the weeds of that and lead them very actively. Again, uh, the, the proof is in the pudding, and I think in that I built a solid, solid record of accomplishment. In fact, I would put my record of concrete accomplishment on issue after issue after issue next to anyone's, from uh, the highway bill that we're working on now to coastal restoration efforts where I've been a leader, hurricane recovery. Uh, saving uh, flood insurance for Louisiana because we had to reform that uh, to get it right for Louisiana citizens. Mr. Edwards? Well, Kelly, thank you for the question. Uh, after my graduation from West Point, I was commissioned a United States Army officer. Uh, I led a platoon of soldiers. Ultimately, I commanded a rifle company in 82nd Airborne Division. Uh, that is ex an executive position as a commander uh, responsible for 150 paratroopers. Uh, and when we would go to the field and, and train, uh, that number would grow to sometimes 250. Uh, also, I have worked uh, the last eight years as a state representative managing that office 
and being a chairman of committees uh, in the legislature that requires me uh, to call committee meetings and issue the agenda, uh, whether it was being on the Military and Veterans uh, Special Committee in the House of Representatives, which by the way, I resurrected that uh, committee, it had gone dormant, and I used that committee to, to do a lot of work on behalf of veterans across the state of Louisiana, uh, from strengthening our war veterans' homes to making sure that cemeteries were open and that our parish service officers remained in uh, place in the parishes to enable uh, our veterans to access the services that they're entitled to. All right, now, gentlemen, it's your turn to ask each other a question. Mr. Vitter, you'll ask Mr. Edwards first. Mr. Edwards, you'll have a minute to respond, and then you will have a 30-second rebuttal, Mr. Vitter. And the topic is about governing style. Great. Thanks, Beth. Well, uh, John Bell, I wanted to ask you about governing style. You often talk about shared sacrifice, particularly given the enormous challenges we face as a state. Uh, but when I look at your concrete record, others look at your concrete record, I don't see that shared sacrifice required of politicians, yourself, your legislative colleagues, other insiders in the system. Uh, I see something very different. I mean, very soon after coming into office, you voted uh, for yourself getting 123% pay raise. In addition to that, you voted for yourself getting a per diem increase on top of that. You've opposed significant ethics reform, opposed a bill to mandate penalties on government employees who take illegal gifts, oppose uh, greater transparency for elected officials. You've expressed opposition to the concept of term limits. So uh, this really does go to governing style. What real sacrifice will you ask of political insiders, the politicians, not just hardworking taxpayers who seem to have to pay more and more and more for government? Senator Vitter, you've been lying sideways in the public crawl since 1992. Uh, you make $40,000 a, a year more now in the Senate than when you got elected to the Senate. Uh, that's more than I make, you make more per month than I make in a year. Uh, so I'm not going to take a back seat to you on any of these issues that you just raised. And in fact, I voted for every single bill in the first ethics reform special session uh, that we had in 2008. Uh, so shared sacrifice, absolutely, uh, there is shared sacrifice. Um, I have led by example. I am very proud of the work that I have done in the legislature on a whole range of issues. Uh, and you, know, you asked so many different uh, things there rather than, than one question. Uh, but I will tell you, as it relates to term limits, uh, I believe that there are term limits already. Every, every office has a certain term, whether it's four years or six years, and the, the voters are able to decide whether you're going to stay in that office or not. And they are clearly able, when they want to, uh, to turn someone out of office. And I think you're going to experience that pretty soon. Well, uh, again, Beth, I think this illustrates big differences between us in terms of philosophy, philosophy about governing. I've always fought uh, against the political establishment because, quite frankly, I think the political esta establishment is way too isolated from normal voters, and they don't understand normal voters' everyday lives. That's why I've fought automatic pay raises. That's why I never joined the congressional retirement system, won't get a penny from it ever. That's why I fought the special Obamacare exemption and don't get that taxpayer-funded subsidy, even though my colleagues in Congress do. And certainly I led the fight to establish term limits in Louisiana. I believe in that concept and I think we need to return to citizen legislators, not uh, politics as a profession. Thank you, Mr. Vitter. Now, Mr. Edwards, it's your turn to pose a question to Mr. Vitter. Sure. David, in the last 16 years, you've only passed five of 565 bills that you've authored. You've been called the most corrupt member of Congress three times. You've been named the least effective member of Congress in either party, and you don't show up for work. The best indicator of what someone's going to do tomorrow is what they did yesterday, and your behavior shows that you are a virtual Bobby Jindal clone more concerned with helping friends and your personal gratification than being accountable to voters and taxpayers. How is it that you don't represent a third Bobby Jindal term? Well, John Bell, uh, first of all, as you know, you're completely misrepresenting my record. You know, you talk about bills you introduced that passed. Uh, you have to look at things I fought for, worked with others on, on a bipartisan basis, was a prime author on, 
that did pass. And that record of bipartisan accomplishment I'll put next to anybody, certainly including yours. I mean, for instance, uh, a water resources bill that I co-wrote with Barbara Boxer of California, enormously important for the maritime sector of our economy, for coastal restoration. Uh, important measures like fixing the flood insurance crisis. I help lead that effort, yes, with others, on a bipartisan basis. Uh, coastal restoration. I've been extremely involved in that, helping make the huge progress we've made in the last several years to fund the work we need to do. Hurricane recovery. I work nonstop with our delegation, with others, to pull us out of that dark time in terms of recovery from Katrina and Rita and those other disasters. The Steve Gleason Act, which we just right. passed into law. So it's a very time. full, robust record of bipartisan accomplishment. Mr. Yeah. Well, 500, I'm sorry, five out of 565 bills does speak for itself. Uh, you have been named the least effective member of Congress. You have one of the worst attendance records in the United States Senate of all of those members, of all 100 of them. Uh, and you certainly said that you endorsed Bobby Jindal three times. Uh, I like Bobby, I respect his leadership, and I agree with all his political values. That's your record. Follow-up questions, reporters. Yes, uh, I would like to bring it back to the state legislature and how y'all will interact with lawmakers. Um, would y'all have a plan to testify in front of committees or would you not? For if getting I, forward I, your I initiatives? would, as I said a few minutes ago, I'm a very hands-on person. I would be interacting with individual legislators all the time as I do now. Most of them have my personal cell and I interact with them constantly. I would be on the, on the floor or off the floor in committees, whatever it took. So that's a very different governing style than we've seen in the last several years under Governor Jindal. I've exhibited that governor style in the U.S. Senate, I'm, I think, with sorry, real effectiveness. Uh, Ed, Senator, I'm sorry. Mr. Mr. Edwards, yeah. would you like to continue? Yeah, absolutely. I, I will testify. Uh, I lead from the front. I lead by example. I will testify in support of the bills that mm -hmm. I'm proposing to the legislature. Uh, I will meet with not just the leadership, but with rank and file members of the legislature as well, both in the House and the Senate. I will tell you that I haven't had a meeting with Bobby Jindal now in many, many months, certainly predating uh, this most recent legislative session. That is not my leadership mm -hmm. style. We need to move on to All the right, next topic. We're moving on to the next topic, and the next topic, K-12 education. Jeremy, you have the question. Uh, as a state, we've seen significant reforms and changes over the past 20 years, including uh, school accountability measures for uh, teachers and students, uh, growth in the recovery school district, charter schools. Uh, this is in addition to uh, vouchers and school choice mechanisms. Uh, aside from Common Core, and I know that's a big list, could you pick a couple of those that you would keep or strengthen or get rid of uh, from that list that I, that I just went through? Mr. Mr. Edwards. Edwards. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm going to support charter schools. Uh, when charter schools uh, help the parishes, and the parishes obviously are in need of help. However, I believe in local control of education. I believe that local taxpayers and voters and parents ought to be able to hold their school board members accountable for how dollars are spent and children are educated. So under our accountability system, for example, if a district has an A or B letter grade, I believe they ought to have the final decision of whether a new charter school opens in that district or not. Uh, if, if the letter grade is a C, D, or F, I think it's probably appropriate for the Bessie board to have the opportunity to re review and perhaps uh, reverse the denial of that charter application. Uh, I also have no plans to end the voucher system. It was unconstitutional when it was passed. I voted against it for that reason, and certainly the Supreme Court held that it was unconstitutional. I will not end it, but I will conform it to its stated purpose. It'll be to give parents of kids who are trapped in failing schools a choice. Jeremy, this is a huge issue where John Bell and I have dramatically different records. And if you look at the specific record, you'll see that on all of those reform efforts, I've been an active leader for charters all the way, for voucher scholarships all the way. Choice fundamentally empowers parents, particularly from poor families and teachers and site-based leaders. Uh, also, accountability, I've been strongly in support of that. John Bell's record is very consistent in the opposite direction. 
He can try to talk a good game now, but the record is the record, and it's very consistent in the opposite direction against charters. He would limit those opportunities, as he just admitted, voting against the voucher scholarship uh, proposal when it first came up, uh, voting consistently against accountability over and over and over, because fundamentally he's been doing the work and charting the course of the teachers' unions, not parents, not empowering parents who need it the most. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. It's now your opportunity to pose a question to Mr. Vitter, Vitter on this topic of education. Sure. Uh, just like Bobby Jindal, with whom you said you share all the same political values, you were for Common Core before you were against it. And in fact, you were a strong supporter of Common Core. Then you were against it in a fundraising letter. Then you were for it again. And now you flip-flopped again and you want to believe people to believe that you're against it. Uh, you've repeatedly put your personal interest ahead of the common interest, and when the political winds change, so do you. Uh, so just like Bobby Jindal, you put personal ambition over what is best for our students and teachers. So on this issue, why should Louisiana parents trust you today? Well, John Bell, you're talking about Common Core, first of all. Um, it's you who said at the press club, quote, with respect to the Common Core state standards, I'm okay with those standards, close quote. You supported that. You said that. It's you who said in The Advocate uh, in 2014, quote, the standards themselves are fine, close quote. You said, quote, certainly there's no communist conspiracy about Common Core. This isn't some federal takeover of education. You said that about Common Core, uh, not me. I have a specific concrete plan to get us out of Common Core, to get us out of the park test. It's been part of my plan in this governor's race all along. It's all at davidvitter.com part of my detailed plan on all the major challenges we face. Mr. Edwards, a response? Senator, I have been voting against Common Core since it was first brought to the legislature in 2014. That is my record, 2014 and in 2015. I did make statements such that the standards themselves are not a communist conspiracy. But I've never said that the standards ought to be adopted in wholesale fashion in Louisiana without being vetted by our parents, our educators, and made changes where necessary. That has been my record from the beginning. I have been against Common Core. My voting record is 100% consistent on that. I have never flip-flopped. You flip-flopped and then flip-flopped again. Mr. Vitter, it's your turn to ask a question on K-12 education. Yeah, John Bell, I want to go back to this choice in education issue because I really think it's the premier civil rights issue of our time, whether every child in Louisiana and America has the right to a great education. Uh, as we've discussed before, you are in favor of greatly limiting the opportunity to establish charter schools. You wouldn't allow it unless an entire school system is DRF. You proposed that legislation before. That would cut out 6,800 students in Lafayette Parish, for instance, who are in D or F schools from being able to enjoy new charter schools there. Statewide, that's 170,000 kids who are in D or F schools. Your question. Uh, you're limiting those charter opportunities. What do you say to those poor families who aren't going to get those full charter opportunities because of your specific legislation? First of all, when, when it comes to vouchers, I voted against the scheme because it was unconstitutional. My oath of office means something to me. When it says you're going to support the Constitution and laws of the United States and of the state of Louisiana, I take that seriously. My decision was affirmed by the Supreme Court. And when that happened, $24 million that had been stolen from local public school districts had to be returned to them so that those school students that you're talking about could receive the services that they were entitled to. Now, I believe in local control of education. And when a school district is performing well, it ought to be in control of the decisions about whether a new charter school will open. Otherwise, the creation of a charter school is going to divert funding away from the programs that have made that school district successful to begin with. And I believe that is the right thing to do because if local parents and, and taxpayers and voters don't have the ability to hold their school board members accountable for how dollars are spent and how children are educated, it's only a matter of time before they stop authorizing new taxes or even the renewal of taxes. That will harm more children. 
Well, John Bell, as you know, in all of those school systems you're talking about, there are failing schools, DRF schools. You're going to limit and trap those students without the choices that more charters as well as voucher scholarships would give them. The record is the record, and you can try to talk a good game, but the record is the record. And on education, you have fought all of these reforms every step of the way. You fought the voucher scholarships. You've tried to limit charters. You've, con you've, you've uh, co uh, authored, excuse me, at least four different bills to curtail charter schools. Uh, certainly accountability. You haven't consistently opposed Common Core. You have consistently opposed accountability. And that's what you're trying to point to in terms of supposed opposition to Common Core. Thank you very much. We're out of time on this particular topic, but we go to the next one with Kelly, and it'll be posed to Mr. Vitter. Louisiana has been dealing with significant budget cuts for the last several years. This year, the legislature raised more than $700 million in new revenues, yet another huge shortfall looms. Given where we stand today, do we solve our problem by further shrinking state government, or should we match our revenue should we better match revenue with spending? Well, Kelly, quite frankly, we need to do both. And I have a balanced approach on both sides of the equation. I laid that this approach months ago in my detailed plan. It's on our website at davidvitter.com. I said the first thing I would do when I'm sworn in as governor is call a special legislative session focused exclusively on this. I would start on the spending side. And structurally, I would propose reforms to undedicate most areas of the budget so we can roll up our sleeves, get in the weeds, and cut spending in those areas that we can't afford or are wasteful that are off limits now. That's the biggest structural reason higher ed has gotten disproportionate cuts. And I've been specific about that. And then I said yes on the tax side. We need to broaden the tax base. We need to get rid of certain exemptions and credits and deductions that don't produce for the economy don't produce for the taxpayer. I've given several examples in our plan. So I think as opposed to John Bell, I would have a balanced approach that looks clearly at both sides of the equation. Mr. Evers. Well, Kelly, we have to do both. You always look for new ways to create efficiencies and deliver state services uh, with a cost savings. You've got to expand your flexibility to allocate cuts across a broader spectrum of the budget so that you're not focusing those cuts on higher education and health care and other critical priorities. Uh, you do that principally by looking at the statutory dedications, but also the constitutional dedications, but those are harder and take longer because you've got to get a uh, two-thirds vote in the legislature and then approval by the voters themselves. Uh, we're also going to accept federal dollars back into Louisiana. When they help us meet our obligations to our people and save us money, uh, we're going to do that principally with the Medicaid expansion. Uh, and I will tell you that we're going to focus on growing the economy in the way that produces net new revenue, where we're not incentivizing the growth to the point where there's not revenue to show for it. That's far superior than raising tax rates, for example. But the biggest thing is we're going to have to do is reduce or eliminate tax giveaways that cost too much, don't produce enough return on investment. We can create savings on those tax expenditures to reallocate to our higher priority items. Mr. Vitter, you may ask the first question on budget and taxes. Well, it goes directly to this. Uh, John Bell talks about a balanced approach, but John Bell, your record is just very, very different. It's another area where we have completely different records, which I think suggests would lead in very different directions. This past year in the legislative session, you voted for enormous number of taxes, $2.1 billion. Um, you have a plan on your website that you're touting that is a $1.54 billion tax increase on the 161,000 families that are involved. And yet, you have never specifically off, off, authored a single piece of legislation to undedicate any area of the budget. You have never authored a single piece of legislation to cut in those areas. That is not a balanced record. So why should voters uh, believe you in saying that you're going to take a balanced approach when the concrete record is very, very different? It's all taxes, no budget reform, no cuts. Mr. Ed. Well, first of all, what the voters shouldn't believe is you and that ridiculous question that you just asked uh, with figures that you just made up out of thin air. Uh, my record is very clear. I did vote for exactly the sort of things that I just talked about. 
reducing tax giveaways that cost too much and don't produce enough return on investment to create savings that we then reallocated to higher priority items like saving LSU, which was threatened with bankruptcy this year had we not done so. Like making sure our charity hospital, the safety net hospital system stayed open. Like making sure that the medical school in Shreveport had the money to continue to operate. Those were the hard choices that we had to make this year. And I did vote for those measures because they were the right thing to do and they're fully consistent with what I just said I will continue to do as our governor. Because we're not gonna stay in this ditch that we're in under Bobby Jindal. We're gonna roll up our sleeves, work together, and we're gonna pull ourselves out and we're gonna start adequately financing our priorities. That is my commitment to the people of Louisiana. Well, John Bell, I honestly think you just proved my point. I asked about a balanced approach and what is on the saving and reform of government side. You talked about a tax measure getting rid of an exemption or a credit or a deduction, which is essentially a tax increase. We need a balanced approach. And your record is all taxes, no budget reform, no savings. Uh, that's the record. You haven't authored a single bill to undedicate any part of the budget. If I'm missing it, please name the bill. You haven't authored a single bill to go in those areas and cut the budget. It's just not there. You have never proposed that, never led in that effort, but you voted for $2.1 billion of taxes this year, and you're proposing much more on top of that. Mr. Edwards, your chance now to pose a question on the same topic. Sure. Uh, David, your pledge for Grover Norquist and out-of-state special interest calls you to repeatedly to vote to send our jobs overseas, jobs of Louisianans, jobs of Americans. Uh, Bobby Jindal's pledge of Grover Norquist caused our state's budget to implode. Uh, you've been unfaithful to Louisiana taxpayers, and why should they believe that you've changed? Well, John Bell, as you know, I've taken no pledge to Grover Norquist in dealing with our challenges in the state budget, and I've laid out a truly balanced approach in terms of doing that. Also, you constantly refer to Bobby Jindal, and I get that politically. The fact of the matter is that I have on several occasions publicly fought, butted heads, disagreed with Bobby Jindal on important things. His use of one-time money to plug, plug the budget hole. You voted for that a lot. I opposed him very vocally in 2012 on that. I led the charge to stop abusive legacy lawsuits. He didn't want to do that and you were on his side. And I dragged him kicking and screaming to propose and pass that reform. So I've disagreed with him on a number of occasions. In contrast, when have you ever publicly disagreed strongly with your party leader, Barack Obama? When did you take him on publicly? When did you stand up at the 2012 Democratic National Convention and say, no, he's wrong on this. He's wrong on Obamacare. He's wrong on gay marriage or anything else. It's never happened in any sort of clear Thank public you. way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Well, you're wrong, and you have signed the Grover Norquist tax, uh, anti-tax plan. How am I wrong about because disagreeing you, publicly because, with because Barack Obama? You said you hadn't signed it, and, and you just lied. You signed the Grover Norquist tax pledge when you were in Washington, D.C. Uh, and, and in fact, I have stood up against the president with respect to the moratorium. Uh, I voted for a resolution uh, calling on him to direct uh, the Secretary of Interior to take that moratorium down. Just the other day, I stood up and opposed the decision not to go forward with the Keystone Pipeline because that is the wrong decision for our country and for our state. It would create jobs, allow for energy independence. And, and so if you believe, sitting here tonight, that the president poses the biggest threat yeah. to our future in Louisiana, you need to stay in Washington and deal with that. I, I do Edwards, believe that because I believe he poses the biggest threat to our country. Then stay in Washington and country. deal with it. With our, our biggest problems here are Bobby Jindal-created okay. problems. Gentlemen, we're, we can continue that conversation because we're in the next topic we're talking about, and that is workforce development. And Jeremy, your question. So We've been told that there's an industrial, industrial boom coming uh, for qualified workers, particularly in the technology sector, but there aren't enough skilled workers. We all know this, this formula, this equation. Um, you know, in southwest Louisiana, there, there's supposed to be a need of 35,000 jobs over the next five years. Uh, meanwhile, uh, CenturyLink and Monroe is trying to bring in engineers and technical workers to fill such jobs and they're, they're finding that difficult. Uh, can you give us two or three specific examples of what you're going to do to address that need over the next sure. four years? 
first, this is critically this is critically important because in one generation's time, we're going from a situation where only 25 percent of our people needed some education beyond high school in order to get a good job. Now that number is going to be two thirds of our people. Uh, you have to first of all reinvest in higher education. That includes four-year universities, but also our community and technical colleges. The state of Louisiana under Bobby Jindal has cut state support for all of higher education more than any other state in the nation over the last eight years and raised tuition on its kids more than any other state in the nation in the same time period. That is the perfect recipe for disaster. We have to do better. We have to make sure that we're aligning workforce needs uh, with the job creation opportunities that are out there uh, so that kids are getting the education that allows them to have the certified skill, the training necessary to succeed to land those jobs. And we've got to do it around the state. You were talking about CenturyLink in Monroe. What we know is that since the end of the recession in 2010, job creation in the state has been positive overall. But when you get to Alexandria and points uh, further north, it's either been zero or negative. And a key to making sure that we can address this is investing in our higher education system around the state. Mr. Vitter? Well, Jeremy, uh, I have a lot of detailed proposals in this area in our plan at davidvitter.com. You asked for a few, so let me highlight three. Number one, our maritime sector is enormously important and great potential for growth. I think that's been woefully ignored under Bobby Jindal and under his Louisiana economic development. I propose structural reforms so we would focus on ports, maritime, and have real leaders built into LED as well as DOTD to help me do that, a sub-cabinet focused on growing those jobs. Uh, secondly, uh, we need to be uh, much more effective in terms of addressing the burden, burden of litigation. We need litigation reform because we are hurting because of abusive lawsuits led by trial lawyers who are, by the way, funding John Bell Edwards' campaign. I've laid out detailed proposals to make those reforms, like Texas did in the 1990s, and that was a major factor leading to their very, very robust economy. There are a lot of other detailed proposals Thank in my plan. Thanks. Mr. Edwards, a question for Mr. Vitter? Sure. David, you have consistently voted against job training for Louisiana's veterans, many of whom are seeking gainful employment to support their families after their dedicated service to our nation. Uh, if you can't make those who protected our freedom part of your jobs plan, what kind of plan is it? Well, John Bell, you're just wrong. I have a very strong record in terms of supporting our veterans. It often starts with individual cases, helping them get the proper treatment and benefits they need. And I spend a lot of time personally, along with my great staff, helping veterans on those issues with great results. Talk to the veterans who have interacted with my office. I know you don't want to do that, but talk to them. Ask them how they feel about my representation of them. Ask them how they feel about my leadership to make sure we get the community-based clinics we need for veterans, particularly the new ones that we're building in Lafayette and Lake Charles. I've worked closely with Charles Bustani. I'm proud he's endorsed me and supporting me in this effort. And we're getting those community-based clinics The, the built. question was about that, jobs training. Yeah, and, and jobs training yeah. at the VA. I've sponsored legislation this year as the chair of the Small Business Committee to put increased emphasis through the SBA and through the VA, specifically for, vet for veterans, as they make the transition from wartime to Thank work. You. And I've helped lead that effort as David, chair of the David, Small Business David, your, your record is that you voted against the GI Bill's educational benefits for veterans, moving that from $1,100 a month to $1,500 a month in 2008. In 2012, you voted no on the Veterans Jobs Corps Act, would have invested $1 billion in new job training for veterans to help them find work. You voted no on the National Defense Appropriations Act, which provided for job training to help prepare members of the armed forces uh, for civilian employment. Uh, your, your record on these issues is atrocious when it comes to job training for veterans and helping them to transition uh, from warriors uh, to workers in, in the country. Now it's your turn, Mr. Vitter. Yeah, John Bell, economic development, workforce development is critical. Again, uh, you're trying to portray this myth that somehow you're a conservative or a moderate, you're in the middle, you're going to unite and you have a mainstream record. But if you look at the record, it's, it's very different. Uh, leading 
pro-business groups and economic development groups give you a very low score. National Federation of Independent Business, 23% rating. Uh, the top economic development group in the state, Louisiana Association of Business and Industry, 25% lifetime rating. That's lower than Mitch Landrieu and Mary Landrieu and Bill Jefferson. That's the bottom 10% of the legislature. Why should voters think that is a pro-economic development workforce development record that's going to grow jobs and grow the economy? Well, first of all, the Louisiana Association of Business and Industry this year gave over 90 legislators F grades. I was one of those because it didn't like the way we supported our universities and our hospitals and the people of Louisiana. I can live with that. I will also tell you that the Louisiana Association of Business and Industry is headed by someone who is a very strong supporter and former executive counsel and chief of staff to Bobby Jindal. Today, they endorsed you because they want a third Jindal term out of David Vitter, except that they would like to have a third Jindal term on steroids. And when it comes to voting records, I don't intend to give anybody 100% except for my wife. Well, uh, again, uh, John Bell, you try to portray yourself as a conservative. The record is the record, and it suggests something completely different. Now, you can try to talk about Bobby Jindal, but these are mainstream economic development groups. And I'm not talking about this year, giving these Fs this year. I'm talking about a lifetime rating of 25%. I'm talking about comparing that lifetime rating uh, to Mitch Landrieu and Mary Landrieu and Bill Jefferson. They all score higher. I'm talking about the fact that you're in the bottom 10% in terms of those ratings about jobs and economic development. Thank you. That's not Thank you very a conservative, much. that's not a it's moderate, anything of the like. It's time for us to move on to another topic, and Kelly will talk about uh, health care. Yes. As in the realm of education, our state has seen several changes over the past few years in the way public health care is delivered. Bayou Health, La Chip, and public-private partnerships. Would you keep the policies we have now and work out the issues we currently face, or would you go in a different direction altogether? Mr. Ritter. Well, you mentioned a few different things, so let's go down the list. The public-private partnerships, I think, are a good reform, but they need work. And I've specifically been proactive, leading the charge to improve the public-private partnership in North Louisiana, which needs the most work. Lot chip, I strongly support. I think that needs to continue to be an important piece of the puzzle and in the mix. Uh, Medicaid expansion is a huge issue in this area. We have very strong differences on that. John Bell would immediately lunge into Medicaid expansion under Obamacare, under Barack Obama's terms. I said I would only consider it under Louisiana terms. If you look at states who have done what John Bell is proposing to do, like Kentucky, their costs have soared way beyond anything they projected. Kentucky's costs are at least double what they were projected to be. They're facing a budget crisis because of that and just elected a new Republican governor largely on that issue. So those are some of the, the big differences between us. Mr. Edwards. Well, first of all, I do support the move for the public-private partnerships, and we've got to make it work. I will tell you it wasn't done well. Uh, today, the state of Louisiana owes the federal government $190 million because uh, the Bobby Jindal plan was an illegal scheme to draw down dollars that we weren't entitled to. Well, we've got to strengthen that because I believe in taking care of people. My mother was an emergency room nurse at a charity hospital for 30 years. Uh, this is near and dear to my heart, and we have to take care of the uninsured people in Louisiana. Lot Chip has been a great uh, uh, success in Louisiana, expanding the Medicaid program with that. And we have already reformed Medicaid in Louisiana. We don't have the fee-for-service model anymore. We've gone to a capitated plan, a managed care plan administered by five insurance companies. So we are going to expand the Medicaid program when I'm governor. And it is not the Obama plan. It is the Louisiana plan. We've already reformed it in Louisiana. And it would have saved $52 million this year alone. That's how it was scored. 30 states have done it, 14 with Republican governors. This isn't right versus left. This is right versus wrong, and it's the right, right thing to do, and I will do it as governor. Mr. Vitter, you have the first question. Well, the biggest issue around in health care is Obamacare, the core of Obamacare, as well as Medicaid expansion. 
Uh, John Bell, you have supported all of that, including the core mandates of Obamacare. You voted in support of that in 2013. Very clear vote, HB 429. Uh, that fundamental mandate is exactly what threw 98,000 Louisianians off the health care plans they had and they wanted to keep. Obamacare said, no, we're not allowing that. We know better that's not good enough. Uh, that fundamental mandate has led to dramatically increasing costs. Yeah. And folks are getting their premiums right now and they're soaring. What do you say to middle class Louisiana families who got thrown off a plan they wanted to keep, who faced those soaring premiums? I'll say that the Affordable Care Act came from Congress. That's where you sit. We haven't been voting in Louisiana on mandates for Obamacare. You're making that up, David. And I will tell you that if you're worried about health insurance premiums going up, you should support the Medicaid expansion because every family with private insurance is paying $1,000 extra per year to cover the uncompensated care that hospitals are rendering. And because they don't get compensated, they're building it into the contracts when they negotiate with health insurance companies. That results in higher premiums. So not only are we paying the taxes to the federal government and not accepting them back so that our working poor, 250,000 of them, get the benefit of health care coverage with our tax dollars that are instead going to the other states that did that, we're also paying more in terms of private insurance. Uh, that is a disaster uh, for this state. We need to do better by our people. We need to bring those dollars home. We need to save tax dollars in the process, save premium dollars in the process as well. It's just the right thing to do. It's, it's called putting Louisiana first. And I know that's foreign to you, David, but that's what we need to do. Well, John Bell, again, the record's the record. And it's all, by the way, at lagovernorfacts.com in case you want to look and see for yourself. Very specific vote in 2014, HB 429. It was a vote by you directly on the core of Obamacare, and you sided with the president. In my opinion, that's siding against the people of Louisiana. That's what threw 98,000 Louisianians off the health care they wanted to keep. In terms of Medicaid expansion, the 14 Republican governors you're talking about used the model I'm proposing. They didn't say, absolutely, we'll do it under your terms. They negotiated Thank their you. own terms. Thank you very much. Mr. Edwards, you have a chance to pose a question on this subject, too. Sure. Uh, while you've been in Congress, you voted to end Medicare as we know it for 700,000 Louisiana seniors. Uh, that kind of cruelty and fiscal irresponsibility has no place in government. Uh, the seniors deserve to know uh, whether you plan to balance our budget on their backs as well. Uh, how can you justify ending one of the most successful insurance programs in our nation's history and asking our seniors to pay more? John Bell, you know I'm for Medicaid and haven't voted to end it as we know it. You know that's the case. Now this attack is exactly what we hear from the National Democrats. I hear this from Harry Reid over and over on the Senate mm -hmm. floor. Hear it from Barack Obama over and over. I have never said I want to end Medicare as we know it. I've never voted that way. In fact, one of several top reasons uh, I voted against Obamacare is it stole from Medicare. Um, it stole from Medicare $750 billion to create a whole new entitlement. It weakened Medicare. And so that's my record on Medicare, which I'm very proud of. Again, you're just spreading the, the old fears and old lies of national Democrats we hear it all the time from Harry Reid, from Barack Obama, from all the rest. You hear it all the time because it's your record. In 2013 and 2014, you voted for budgets that would have turned Medicare into a voucher system that would have increased the health care cost on our seniors and made them pay the difference. Um, that's your record. Uh, and, and that's the Paul Ryan budget that, that you, have, you have supported. Uh, and the people of Louisiana need to know that you're going to treat them uh, better than that as they go into their senior years and they deserve dignity and security uh, in their retirement as seniors. Uh, and they need to know that they've got a governor who's got their back and isn't going to balance the budget on their backs. Uh, that's the commitment that I make to our seniors. Well, gentlemen, if we're moving from one thorny topic to another one, and that's uh, the state's uh, infrastructure, roads, highways, ports, everything, uh, a, chair, a question, Jeremy? I'm sure you all know what number I'm going to say, which is $12 billion. That's the backlog of projects in Louisiana. Right. Uh, both of you support uh, directing money back to the Transportation Trust Fund. 
Uh, but that doesn't seem to be enough to actually address the larger problem. Uh, how would you generate more money to do that, or is it time to concede that this is really too big of an issue, too big of a price tag to actually address? And, and I watched the 2003 uh, gubernatorial runoff debate, and a similar question was asked. So how do we break that tradition going on do a dozen years, Representative Edwards? Well, first of all, it is a big problem. But until you fix the Transportation Trust Fund, it is premature to ask the people of Louisiana to pay any more, whether it's a toll or whether it's an additional uh, gasoline tax. Uh, the fact of the matter is that up to $60 million recently has been leaving the Transportation Trust Fund not paying for roads and bridges but going to the state police uh, for traffic control on our highway system. Uh, that is wrong. That's not the expectation of our taxpayers when they pay that gas tax. I will get the Transportation Trust Fund under control in my first year. I will wean the state police out of the Transportation Trust Fund. That is $60 million right there. I will also increase uh, by 25 percent the amount of our capital alley bill, uh, bill each year that goes to transportation infrastructure projects. That's an additional 75 million dollars per year. And by the way, as soon as we do that, we're also going to double our investment in the port priority program from 20 million to 40 million dollars a year overnight. That's just the right thing to do. Now at that point in time, once we've cleaned it up and we see that we don't have enough revenue to go forward to maintain the system that we have in terms of our highways, uh, then and only then will we consider tolls or any other revenue measure. Well, Jeremy, we can't ask the hardworking citizens of Louisiana to put more money in the bucket when there are gaping holes at the bottom of the bucket, gaping holes. And that's the situation now, and John Bell has voted for that situation. That's the situation now. Last year, only 11 cents of every dollar of revenue associated with the State Transportation Trust Fund went to roads and bridges, went to concrete and steel and asphalt. That's ridiculous, and I have a detailed plan to change that. Again, it's all at davidvitter.com. But I have outlined a specific second step, it's also in my plan, which is to lead an effort among chambers, business groups, leading citizen, citizens, legislators, to develop a high priority building program. High priority projects in key areas of the state to spur economic development linked to new revenue, tied to that, go to the voters, go to citizens and say this is wor what we're going to build in a finite amount of time. If you support it, we're not going to spend the money any other way and we'd go Thank to voters and citizens yeah. to you. earn their approval yeah. for that. Mr. Edwards, a question to Mr. Vitter on uh, infrastructure. Sure. As I've mentioned earlier, David, you've been rated as the least effective member of Congress. You have the fifth highest absence rate among your 534 peers in Congress. And nowhere does this show more than on transportation. As a ranking member of the Subcommittee on Transportation, you really haven't lifted a finger uh, to help Louisiana finish I-49 or address the $12 billion backlog of transportation and infrastructure projects that Jeremy just asked us about. You even worked against securing loan forgiveness uh, after Hurricane Katrina for local governments. Uh, how much longer should the people of Louisiana wait for you to start putting Louisiana first as it relates to infrastructure? John Bell, why don't you talk to local leaders, local officials about my work and my record on transportation? I have. That's where the question you'll came hear, from. You'll hear a very different story. No, it didn't. I've, well, I've been a leader on I-49, including as a high-ranking Republican on that committee. We've brought significant money to virtually finish I-49 north and to start I-49 South in a major way. Through that work on that committee, I've helped turn Louisiana from a donor state. We were sending more money through federal gas tax to the federal government than we received back. When I went to Congress, it was about 93 cents on the dollar we were getting back. We're no longer a donor state. We're getting more back than we send to the federal government because of the reforms and because of the work I did with others. And there are lots of specific projects, LA-1, I-49, many critical projects around Louisiana, congestion relief in Baton Rouge and greater New Orleans that have directly benefited as a result. Now, we need to go further, Thank and okay. I'm working on a federal highway Thank you. bill Thanks. now to bring Mr. Edwards. Mr. Edwards. Mr. Edwards. Da David, the fact of the matter is you've been terribly ineffective in the Senate. You worked against local government in Louisiana when they sought loan forgiveness after Hurricane Katrina and Rita with respect to the FEMA loans. 
You worked against the people That's of Louisiana. True. I secured the loan forgiveness, well, John Bell. I helped no, secure no. that very loan no, forgiveness. Sir. And I get my information from the local people who, who lead our municipalities well, and our parishes. So, Mr. Vitter, you have a continue this conversation with your question. Well, uh, again, John Bell's completely misrepresenting the record. I helped secure that very loan forgiveness. Talk to the leaders in St. Tammany who got it. Talk to the leaders in other key parishes. But, but John Bell, you're always talking about fighting Governor Jindal. Um, in fact, there have been eight Bobby Jindal budgets. You voted for, you supported five of them. And on this critical issue of infrastructure, they were horrendous. They stole over and over and over, like you were talking about, from the Transportation Trust Fund. You voted for five of those eight budgets, hundreds of millions of dollars, and you voted for the very budget that I was referring to under which only 11 cents of every dollar of that revenue goes to roads and bridges and steel and concrete and asphalt. Why should voters believe that as, as governor you're going to do something completely different when that's the specific record? Again, LAGovernorFacts.com, that's your record. I have voted for five budgets and, and that means I voted against more than the vast majority uh, I'm sorry, voted against the more budgets than the vast majority of my colleagues. And the reason it'll be different is because, David, I'm going to be the governor. I'm going to set their priorities. As you know, if you don't vote for the budget, then, then and if everybody doesn't vote for the budget, then you don't pass a budget and nothing gets funded. Uh, but as governor, I will be able to control the process and make sure with that line item veto that we will do the things that I'm talking about. Just this most recent year, we actually voted for revenue to make absolutely clear that the state police can get out of the transportation trust fund. That's going to happen in my first year. There will be zero dollars appropriated to the state police out of the transportation trust fund. That will leave that sixty million dollars there. Uh, that is my commitment to the people of Louisiana and it has been all along. And we now have the revenue in place to make sure that that happens. Uh, I did support that revenue because I want to be in a position to make sure that we can restore faith and confidence that the people of Louisiana should have in that trust fund. Well, again, John Bell, there's just this enormous gap between your rhetoric and your record and the votes. Uh, you talk about battling Bobby Jindal, supported five of his eight budgets, five of eight. You talk about protecting the state transportation trust fund. Under those budgets, it was rated over and over and over hundreds of millions of dollars, and you voted for the budget under which 11 cents of every dollar, only 11 cents, goes to transportation and everything else is rated. That's the record. Your rhetoric is different, but that's the record. So, gentlemen, we have come to the, this last topic that we have this evening, and uh, time constraints say let's each try and do 30 seconds response on this first question, and I give it to reporters. Uh, gentlemen, both of you at one point or another in recent forums or with reporters have discussed negative ads that target you. You've discussed trackers that are following around you and your families with video cameras. And more recently, the Louisiana media is writing about private investigators. Uh, have you or your campaigns hired professionals that carry out these services? And if so, is there anything that they have done that you regret? Mr. Vitter. It's a reality these days of campaigns that I've lived with for several years. I've lived with these trackers for many years, and they're associated with every campaign. We haven't directly hired them, but others in support of my campaign have, so I'm not going to say that's not in support of our efforts. Um, I wish that reality were different, but it's, it's certainly not. Uh, but it is a free country, and I think we are entitled to a free and open debate. In terms of negative campaigns, there's nobody who's been the target of more negative campaigning than me. You just look at the numbers, look at the metrics. There are eight different entities that have been attacking me relentlessly. Three right, candidates Mr. in Edwards. the primary, three of their associates. Jeremy, the, the short answer to the question is no. Uh, my campaign has not hired, paid for anybody to do any tracking or any investigations, and in fact, Senator Vitter spent $156,000 on a private investigation and lied about it and said the money was being spent on legal fees. And now we know he says it's a free country. He actually is sending private investigators to spy on a sheriff. 
and there is enough scandal and embarrassment here to last a lifetime. Louisiana doesn't need any more of that. I urge everybody to go to www.tv.com yeah. and watch the press oh. conference that Sheriff Mr. Newell Norman gave today Mr. on this yeah. topic Mr. about Edwards. Senator Vitter. Mr. Edwards, uh, yes, we're going to go into questioning now. So, Mr. Vitter, a question for Mr. Edwards. Well, with John Bell, let's follow up on this. Um, you act holier than now. You've never hired these folks, but the state Democratic Party does it on your behalf. You act holier than now. Oh, we don't uh, do negative campaigning. Well, in fact, you have the most vicious negative ad up right now that veterans have been offended by and ask you to take down. Uh, and somehow you're, you have nothing to do with the trial lawyer pack that has r been running negative campaigns in the millions of dollars for months. I mean, isn't that just completely disingenuous? Somehow you have nothing to do with that. I don't think. Uh, no, it isn't completely disingenuous. Let me, let me finish no, the no, question. No, I'm going to finish. I'll answer the question. You're not living by the honor code, John Bell. You're living by the lawyer's code, trying to parse right. words and create technicalities Mr. Vitter, a question that, here. that don't exist. No, sir. The fact of the matter is, my campaign has not paid for a tracker or a private investigator. I haven't seen any footage of you anywhere from a tracker. Not part of my campaign. It just absolutely isn't. With respect to the negative ad, if it's, if it's a low blow, it's only because that's where you live, Senator. It's 100% truthful. The fact of the matter is you didn't say it was untrue. You want me to take it down because you don't like it. I understand that you don't like it. It hits you where you live. I, and, I'm not talking no, about me saying no, anything, John Bell. No, I'm talking about what veterans have no, said. No, hundreds of what veterans the, have contacted me, and they wanted to know that you were missing out on your public performance of your duties in Congress uh, in order to engage right. in those extracurricular activities that you don't want to admit to. Okay, all right. John so Bell, no, uh, no, again, so let's, you're let, holier than thou when the state Democratic I'm not holier Party than is thou. doing that on okay. your behalf. No, sir. When the trial Nobody is doing anything for me. Doing that on your and you said the trial right. lawyers were working right. for Jay right. Darden. Now it benefits you. They're working for me, I guess. You will say anything at any time. You are unconstrained by the truth. Okay, if we're going to go on, let's go on let, about let, this. Gentlemen, let's, no, let's stop here. Let's, let's each one of you have had a chance to ask each other a question. We're almost to our closing comments right now. So why don't you get 30 seconds on this topic and you get 30 seconds. 30 seconds, Vitter. Yeah, uh, again, John Bell, you're being completely disingenuous uh, to, to suggest that the state Democratic Party isn't your close ally in all of this, to suggest that the trial lawyers aren't doing your dirty work for you. Again, you're not living by some honor code. You're living by some lawyer's code of technicality. And that's not what a transparency and forthrightness is all about. Uh, I'm not suggesting you. anything. Now I'm, I'm saying it. I am not looking at any video footage from you. I haven't had a private investigator to go after you. And with respect to the honor code, Senator, the last part of it is I will not tolerate those who do. You so, are so what a liar. have you said to the you state Democratic Party and about you are this. a cheater. Okay. What have you said and to the steal. trial and I don't tolerate this. that. If you don't and agree with their behavior, why right, are you gentlemen. tolerating and yeah. benefiting from their behavior? I'm not benefiting from anything. I haven't looked at it and I haven't used it. Uh, we were giving what we're going to do right now is to go to our closing remarks we're just about out of town time for our hour debate we thank you for your candid <laughs> and and energetic commentary uh but now we're going to go to our closing mr. remarks Vitter. and mr vitter you begin well thanks well this is certainly an important election and we have two candidates for governor john bell edwards and myself who couldn't offer more starkly different voting records and political philosophies and therefore directions in which we would lead the state. Now it's pretty clear that John Bell wants to talk about anything but the future. He wants to talk about anything but those records and those philosophies and where we would lead the state. Uh, that's because his campaign is built on a myth that he's some sort of a conservative. Uh, that we don't differ much on the issues when we absolutely do. And so I humbly ask for your vote and support. And I ask for you to look on the key issues. Look how we differ in terms of job creation. My support by pro-business groups and economic development groups, his ranking at the bottom of the barrel. On education, my support of charters and voucher scholarships and accountability and reforms 
John Bell has exactly the opposite record supporting the teachers' unions, not parents, families, children. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. I want to start by thanking our veterans. We're on the eve of Veterans Day, and I want to thank them for our ser their service to our country. When I decided to serve our country, nobody asked me whether I was a Republican or a Democrat. And this election, too, is not going to turn on party. It's going to turn on leadership and character. Uh, which candidate is best able to lead this state right now after eight years of miserable, failed policies under Bobby Jindal? Leadership to unite our people, bring our people together, forge consensus, tackle our biggest problems and challenges, and provide real opportunity for our children in Louisiana. That is my record in the legislature. It is a leader, it is a uniter, and I will fight against anyone of any party when they mean to do harm to Louisiana, and I will stand up and fight along the side of anyone of any party when they want to do our state good. I will always be honest with you, I will never embarrass you, and I will always fight to put Louisiana first, and I humbly ask for your vote and for your prayers. God bless you. We would like to thank the candidates for their participation and you, the viewers, for joining us this evening. The choice for governor couldn't be more clear. John Bell Edwards, who answered our country's call and served as a ranger in the 82nd Airborne Division. Or David Vitter, who answered a prostitute's call minutes after he skipped a vote honoring 28 soldiers who gave their lives in defense of our freedom. David Vitter chose prostitutes over patriots. Now, the choice is yours.